Grace and peace be unto you from God, our Creator, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, take our lips and speak through them. Take our hands and work through them. Take our minds and think through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire. I'd like to just briefly introduce myself. My name is Pastor Jerry Borkowski. I serve as one of the assistants to our bishop in the Saskatchewan Synod of the ELCIC. And I live in Regina, Saskatchewan. And I am privileged to live on Treaty 4 territory in the traditional homeland of the Métis. I want to just let you know that the sermon that is being recorded today is at the Living Spirits Center, which is a shared ministry facility here in Regina. And the congregations that share this house is Eastside United, Emmanuel Anglican Parish, and Bread of Life Lutheran Church. And at Bread of Lutheran Church, which is my family's home, Pastor Stuart Miller is our pastor. And so it is a privilege for me to be able to uh, share the good news this day with you. Let me just take a moment to kind of, you know, think, look about how one, I do sermon prep or whatever. It is, and it, I think it kind of identifies the journey I've had. During when, the time when I do my prep work for sermons, there's a certain process that I use and I think most clergy people do. You know, you read the text, um, you want to become familiar with the passage. And when I read the text, I'm, I, I'm wondering or processing, so what does this text say? What, what am I hearing? Or, and I, then, then I think, well, what, what, not only what am I hearing, but what is it saying to me? And what have you heard when you heard this text being read in your congregation? You know, in prep work, we want to be always mindful of where we are in our world today. Like, what's going on around us? Just think of some of the challenges that we have lived these past 16 months, and for some maybe even longer. Thinking about the pandemic and, and all that is connected to it, that has brought, you know, identified some of those loopholes that we thought were not even issues. I think of long-term care facilities. Think about the anxiety and depression and the struggles that people have had in a variety of ways as they try to work through this, following the regulations and Sometime one day this way and the next day that way and you just don't know where and all you do is just wonder, Lord, let it be over already. And we're still in the midst of that storm. And that wasn't even enough. And think about just what has happened where the remains of 250 children, the remains were found buried in the Kamloops Indian Residential School. And all of what that has brought on and we live with that. And enough, if you think that wouldn't be enough already, and then we've discovered, and it's no surprise, that racism is rather well in our country. And then to top it off, we're a family of four, five, four are killed, and one young boy is left an orphan, killed by someone, a person who hated Muslims. So when I read a, te a biblical text, I'm not looking for academic or theological controversies. I mean, that's another topic and for another day, and that happens at a different space and time. But rather, I come to the text for counsel and comfort in dealing with this life, where I live in life. In German, we say, in das Sitzenleben, where I sit in the middle of life, I want the word to speak to me, to speak to us, so that we hear that word and be able to be to find our way through. Two of the resources that I've used and I use quite often is Dr. David Lose, who writes in the meantime, and, and uh, also Dr. Catherine Lewis. Um, both at one time, uh, David Lose taught at Luther Seminary in Minneapolis, now pastor in, in Minneapolis, and Dr. Caroline Lewis, who has the chair of preaching also in Minneapolis. And I've always appreciated their insight into texts. David Lowe puts it this way, he says, when I come to a text for meaning, 
I come to text for meaning, not meaning in the sense of answering all my questions, but meaning what makes life worth living. And I say amen to that. Because that's what we want. That's what we need. That's what we crave as we try to wind our way through the life we are living. Caroline Lewis suggests that as we hear this text, that we probably are expecting another sermon on Holy Communion. We've had three already in a row, and rightly so. But she reminds us that this text, this text from John, John 6, 51 to 58, gives us a slightly different direction, and I very much appreciated that. And so she says, this, but this is not your ordinary sacrament at the table. So how is it not ordinary? Think about it this way. When we gather as the people of God for Holy Communion, for the Eucharist, and as our pastor prepares us for Holy Communion, prepares the table at the altar, and then as he goes through, they go through their liturgy, the pastor goes through the liturgy, we hear the words for the institution of the Lord's Supper. These are the words we hear every time the Eucharist is celebrated. These are central in that part of the liturgy which we call the thanksgiving at the table in our communion liturgy. And it's those words that as I begin, you will know them because you hear them every Sunday. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples. And it goes on about lifting up the cup. The same, and we know those words, we know them by heart because they're, they're imprinted on us. And in this liturgy, we, the words that conclude that part or part of it, the next sentence is, remembering therefore his death, resurrection, and ascension. Now Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have those initial words of the institution of Holy Communion. In these Gospels, the institution of the Lord's Supper is, is linked. First of all, of course, to the Passover. So in each of the Gospels, Jesus is with his disciples and they prepare and they go to celebrate the, the, the Passover. And secondly, they are linked to Jesus' death. Now, John does not include the words to the institution of the Lord's Supper as Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. But John does have in this sixth chapter of John, he does have the, the feeding of the 5,000 as part of that chapter. And where we are told in Verse 11, and then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them. If we can accept that the feeding of the 5,000 and the bread of life discourse that we hear in the gospel text that we, what was read today, this allows us, as, as Dr. Lewis says, to dislodge to, to, to separate, if you will, the sacrament from Jesus' death and locate it into the middle of Jesus' life. To me, that was so helpful as I was trying to, to go labor through this text because this text I found was a really, for me at least, was a difficult text to preach on. I had to really work at it to ever find where it connected with me and life and living. But if we, can, if, if we allow that, that dislodging to, to take place, that gives us permission that gives us permission to ask, so what does John, what John says, how does that make a difference as we understand Holy Communion? What difference does it, does it mean if we take seriously that Jesus says he is the living bread? In John, in the sixth chapter, verse 51, we read, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. And then I'll, the next verse has these words in it, whoever eats of this bread will live forever. These words are in the present tense. They are right now. What John has done, I think, is help us to see, to appreciate, and understand that when we receive Holy Communion, it is a celebration of the abundant life with God. Right now. Not at some other time, but right now. And so it is not only a remembrance of Jesus' death. Now, we know that attention to details is always important whatever work one does. And it is, I think, especially helpful when we do biblical work to note the detail. 
And Caroline Lewis puts it this way. She says that according to John, that according to John, life means according to John, that what you, what you need for your life to be sustained, God provides the abundant life. In 1010, we read, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. John reminds us that eternal life is not something we postpone to our future, but it is our promise in the present right now that that is the gift that we have already. Think about the times that we have said as clergy people probably and have heard the words when we get at a funeral that somehow we talk about, you know, the person has cashed in, has received the fullness of God's grace and glory, and somehow that eternal life is now that's their possession. And yet John reminds us, no, that person has had it for all time. The time that Jesus became part of that person's life, the gift was there. That eternal life is not something postponed, it is present now. That any claims about life with Jesus and life with God means that it is an abiding relationship. It means a real relationship here and now. That Jesus wants us to have that relationship and that the Eucharist is a reminder in the midst of life and living that God is with us. Life is not a remembrance of Jesus' past life only or a hope for the future, but life lived in the moment. And as we read again in verse 16 of John's Gospel, chapter 1, from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Now, just to step back a bit or just take a look to go to the beginning of John's Gospel, the first verse of John's Gospel is, again, words that we all know. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then a few verses later in verse 14, we hear these words, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. In Jesus, the Word made flesh, and the Word was given a physical form, And we meet the God who will be satisfied, who wants us to be with him and in him completely. When Jesus speaks, he is inviting us into that very personal relationship and wants all of who we are, everything. David Lowe puts it this way, that in Jesus, the whole of God meets us to love, redeem, and sustain the whole of who we are, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Throughout John's Gospel, we encounter many of the wonderful images that remind us of this relationship that we have with God. And John uses, John uses these to describe exactly that relationship. Jesus is the shepherd, and we are the sheep. He is the vine, we are the branches. He abides in us. And we abide in him. Abiding is one of those more very common themes in John's gospel. It means of this connectedness, togetherness with Christ. Some of the scholars remind us that the words that John uses here in in these verses in our text, as some of them have said, you know, John here is pressed to the limit of how those words are used. That Jesus' life is so much a part of ours that there can be no separation. That when we receive Jesus, his life, if you will, clings to our bones. A well-known preacher, Martin Kopenhauer, has said it this way, and I quote him. He says, he can no more be taken from the believer's life than last Thursday's breakfast can be plucked from one's body. It is that entwined. This is God's promise made to us in the sacraments, to be one with us, for us, forever, to stick with us, even in us, no matter what, no matter where we are and the struggles we go, to know that God is truly present. Jesus is the living bread. And when we celebrate the Eucharist, God comes to us to offer us promises that we can touch and feel and taste, and eat. Jesus is the word that became flesh and lived among us so that we may have life and have it abundantly. 
Thanks be to God.